here. Yeah, do not marry cousins. And, oh, the election of 1800, well, let's make uh, 1776. What was the big issue about 1776? It's a, hard to take me serious when I have these two phases behind me, but in 1796, what was unusual about the election? For Adams, the Federalist, was elected, but who was his vice president? And what party was Jefferson? And he was a Republican. 1800, they thought they resolved the issue, but why did Jefferson and the Republican choice for Burr, why did they tie? That's a Republican choice for Burr? The Republican choice for Vice President, Burr. Why did they tie? Yeah. Yeah, every elector had two votes. All but one of the Republicans was supposed to vote for Burr and then vote for somebody else so they wouldn't have a tie. They forgot who was not supposed to vote. So they all voted for Burr. And so it went to the House of Representatives. Who threw their support to Jefferson? Yeah, Hamilton. And what? Why did, at least many in the North, why did Jefferson win? Because of that whole college is skewed to the South. Why did Jefferson win? Yeah. And what did what did Northerners call the Three Fifths Compromise? And what did they call Jefferson? What kind of president? And that was because the slave owners owned the or the slave owners control a disproportionate number of the votes. What law tried to restrict the freedom of speech? Yeah, the well, Sedition Act, Alien and Sedition Act. Shut up, Republicans. Let's get to let's get to the philosophy then. So I got to here, right? And that awkward picture with the, uh... one more thing. They talked about the slave issue in 1800, but the Federalists, now in the minority, tried to make it a bigger issue in 1804. And that is when the whispering campaign became much more public. And here is a camp, here is a picture that would attack Jefferson, but all slaveholders. And the issue was, and the name I mentioned was Sally Hemming. So Virginia luxuries, they don't mean all Virginians, they mean slaveholders, since Jefferson's from Virginia, clearly they meant him, so whipping the slaves, or, and remember the fornication laws. Sally Hemings was Jefferson's wife's slave. Okay. Sally Hemings was also Jefferson's wife's half-sister. Do you understand why? They happen to have the same father. Slave owners, you know, you catch that. And Jefferson clear well, Jefferson and her had numerous children who of course became what? Slaves, because of the fornication laws. So Jefferson had all these red-handed slaves. And this became an issue in 1804. Not enough to turn the tide of the election, but this kind of growing drumbeat of what slavery really is. And Southerners did not take it as, well, you're right, slavery is immoral. No, they took it as, and this I do want you to get out down. Southerners took attacks at slavery and people, things like Sally Hemming as a direct attack against their entire way of life. How dare you criticize us? How dare you say we're immoral? How dare you say that we do not lead lives of utmost virtue? So they consider it as an example of how the North hates everyone in the South. Isn't that kind of fascinating, though? By pointing out, this is actually very true. This is not exaggeration. But the South didn't want to hear it. And this, you can see the beginning of the divide. And everybody write down this word, ideology. Ideology is your strongly held belief. We all have ideologies. I've mentioned this once before. Ideologies are something people just know or it's true. And more and more in the South, the ideology was because of attacks like this, which is an attack, but stating the truth. Their ideology was the North hates us. The North hates us. They're out to get us. They're out to destroy us. And talk like this might lead to a slave rebellion. They're out to get us. And once you believe that, it doesn't matter what people in the North say. The 
South will read it as the worst possible option. Obviously, we're doing the stepping stones to civil war. We'll talk more about ideology. We all have ideologies. All of us. We believe them to be true because we believe them to be true. And we all have those. And be wary of them. Because those are the kind of things that lead to wars. Now, I'm saying you go and start a war with Canada today, and that's on film. I'm filming this class. So they now know, all know about your secret goals to attack Canada. With that, Jefferson's elected, and in many ways, this is going to be called the Age of Jefferson. Let me make sure this is being filmed. Oh, what a great view. You see the Soviet flag? That's pretty cool. Not a word. And Jefferson would refer this to the Re revolution of 1800. In, in reality, they didn't make a lot of changes. The basic federalist system existed. They did not change the court system radically. They did not change the government. They did not change the precedents. But it was a, a revolution in this basic idea that they could have a clean, peaceful transference of power. And that is revolutionary. At least up to this moment, it doesn't seem all that revolutionary today in the United States, but it was very revolutionary at the time, where you could have a new leader come in, new representatives, who had a different point of view, and it wasn't because of war, disagreement, revolution, even though Adams was furious. Adams was convinced that Jefferson was, was going to destroy the country, and he refused to go to the inauguration of Jefferson. He was pouting and went home. Only one other president in American history did not go to the inauguration of their successor. Does anyone know who that is? John Quincy Adams, Adams' son. It seems to run in the blood. Very emotional. He didn't want to go to Andrew Jackson's inauguration, so he went home. And Jefferson really did try to portray this idea that he was the people's president. He would ride his horse around the brand new tiny little town of Washington, D.C. This, this watercolor is supposed to represent that in front of the executive mansion. It wasn't called the White House yet. If you call it that, it's not a big deal. But I'm, I try not to just to be um, somewhat precise. But he would ride and he would wear his breeches, kind of tight pants, and they would be dirty or torn, just like he's a common laborer. He tried to act like a common man. And that fit into his philosophy. His philosophy, this idea of regular people controlling the country. And that's where we get to his philosophy. And the philosophy has a number of different components. The first major component is this concept of the common man. And Jeffersonian democracy fits under the concept of the common man. So that's the first moment. Now, I'll explain Jeffersonian democracy in just a second. But the thing about the common man is this. Please do not think common is average, you know, just common, like regular. What it meant is a person who is not born of aristocratic birth. That's a commoner. A commoner is somebody who is not born to wealth, not born to an aristocracy, not born to a elite. Jefferson's philosophy was everybody, regardless of who your parents are, what your status, your position, should be allowed to go as far as their abilities and potentials take them. Doesn't that sound like a document that he wrote? Which one? Do you remember, Megan? Yeah. All men are endowed by the creator of certain inalienable rights. What are these rights? Rights, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And so that kind of fits in that. And that's where we get to the idea. So, oh, his opponents would say you just want mediocre. And they would, his opponents and future opponents of this were called the cult of mediocrity. So basically saying that people born of common birth, meaning the vast majority of people, are inferior. Are inferior. They'll eventually have a very scientific name for this that is garbage science called social Darwinism. We'll get to that down the road. But let me then explain what Jeff Jeffersonian democracy is. Jeffersonian democracy is this then. The common men, do you remember that term I gave you for power? Who has power? Do you remember that term? <sighs> so many terms. Better remember? 
Yes. This is all politics, but in, who has power in politics? It begins with an S. Someone said, oh, no, not speculators. I think he said it. I heard the S. Sovereignty. sovereignty. Speculator sovereignty. That's what I heard. Cool. See, so you were testing. It's a good job. Sovereignty. 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 Who ultimately has power? And what he said is the common man, meaning white man. Let's be clear about it. This is 1801. This is Thomas Jefferson. That they are ultimately sovereign. So that's going to be called democracy. This is not democracy. This is not where everybody has the right to choose their direction. This is not full majority rule. Remember, they're still picking representatives, and a lot of them are not picked by the people. But this is going to become what we think of as democracy. Not true democracy, but that ultimately the people have the power to decide who their leaders are. But that is not democracy. We are a republic. So, but you'll notice something. Was Jefferson Jefferson a common? He was born in very wealthy parents. He had a huge plantation. He had over 200 slaves. This is his mansion, Monticello. Has anyone ever been there? If you ever get a chance, it's really, really, really cool. It's, it's amazing to see how we live, but also all the contradictions because right there, you know, the slave quarters are right out back. But Jefferson talked about the common man, and yet the reality was significantly different. This is what he wanted, almost like the myth. The reality, though, was, well, Jefferson played like he was a common man. That's why I rode around with the torn breaches. How many stories is that building? Five. He personally designed it to give it the illusion that it's only a couple stories, like a basement, main floor, and an upper floor that we're talking about. It has five. The front door is huge. The windows are huge. So it covers one, two, three, four, five stories. And that's not even counting the rotunda. about. So from a distance, it has the illusion of looking smaller. <laughs> but it's so big. You get closer, it's like, oh, wait a second. Giants live here. No. Oh. <laughs> okay. But with that, so this shows a kind of the myth. Jefferson talked a good show, but was that the reality? Jefferson really shows many of the contradictions about the United States. The good and bad things wrapped up. Like every country, we have both. And Jefferson really shows them both. Next, the next big issue is he wanted an agrarian society. We already knew that. But what he thought was would be best is a country of yeomen. Anybody know what a yeoman is? This is a yeoman, this kind of idealized yeoman. Here is a yeoman who is the master of all his domain. <clears throat> okay, yeoman is not only really fun to say. Let's hear it. Say it! Yeoman, isn't that fun? It's not quite as fun as I think. Yeah, I think it's fun. Do we know what a yeoman is? It's a small independent farmer that owns their own land. That's a yeoman. So you're independent, you own your own land. If you're independent, you have then the ability to truly have liberty and to pursue your own happiness. That's why he's opposed to wage earners, or he called them wage slaves. For some reason, I went on a hyphen kick. Jefferson loved hyphens too, so I thought I'd continue the Jeffersonian hyphen movement. And wage earners are not really free. And to Jefferson's point of view, how can you have a republic? where the common man are going to pick their leaders if they're wage slaves. If they're wage slaves, they won't pick what's best for the country. They'll pick what's best to keep them having a job so they get a wage. And that's why he was opposed to Hamilton so much. The only way you can have a free society, he thought, was small independent farmers. They owned their own land. Nobody could ever tell them what to do. Now, of course, there's contradictions here. Was Jefferson a yeoman? He was a big plantation man. He was plantation owner. He was a country gentleman. He was part of the, arist the aristocracy. He was an aristocrat. But he said this. 
Eve implied this. Once again, the contradiction's there. And the world is changing fast. The next big thing would be he was frugal. Frugal. Anybody know what frugal means? Yeah, go ahead. Casigio almost applies like an insult, but it's on the same path. You know, very careful spending. You know, stingy implies I just won't spend, but careful. And so Jefferson would want to cut back on the budget from the Federalists. That means cut the excise taxes on like whiskey and those products, but also cut back on, there's a little blip of military spending, even though we saw the tiny military. They cut back on the army, so that's one of the few forts that still survived after Jefferson. We had a tiny army anyways. And they cut back on the navy. There's the constellation that was built right after the, um, right during the Quasi War. Now, of course, we might need that very quickly, but we wouldn't be fighting a full-scale war in Britain in a decade, would we? The answer is yes. But also, what's he from about? Should the government be careful with the money? We'd find some way to spend $3 million to buy the, the claim of Louisiana. That's finding money. His personal life, he was certainly not frugal. He had the finest library in America. He had the biggest wine collection in the Americas. He had this mansion. He had this luxurious lifestyle. He wasn't going to give that up. Do as I say, not as I do. So there are contradictions, clearly. Next, he feared a large central government. The government. How many here feared the government? Oh, I'll get it. Okay. I got yours. And I'll get to. The proper spelling of government in just a second. But what he believed in the concept of, he said he believed, was in the concept, does anyone speak French in French right now? Anyone? Nobody in here? Yes? Oh, just waiting. Wait a minute, you're in French and you're just keeping that quiet? Because you don't want to be called to say what this word means? If you're speaking French, it'd be laissez-faire, but if you're, but we speak American here. And so it's laissez-faire. And so every professor, every teacher, it's always laissez-faire. They Americanize it. It's laissez-faire. It's hard to get an exact translation, but what that means is hands off by government. Hands off. And that comes from the great economist Adam Smith, who is perpetually looking north in that green picture over there. He's from Edinburgh, so all people from Edinburgh look north. That's the law there. But he thought government should allow, should be hands off and not get involved in the economy. Because as he believed it, government only helps the wealthy, specifically wealthy merchants. Government will only help the wealthy, so if government is hands off and won't act in the economy that much, small farmers can thrive. And so that's why he feared the power in these big cities. And that's why I hated the Assumption Bill. Remember the Assumption Bill? Remember the Bank of the United States? That's only going to help wealthy merchants. He looks back to things like the T Act, which helped the, remember the East India Company, and that government will only help the wealthy. Now, of course, that ignores the fact that he was wealthy and got a lot of government aid. But not only that, that's why Washington, D.C., and that's why I put the pictures here. That's why they wanted it in the South. It was not this big. There was nothing there when they built it. And that's one of the first paintings of the executive mansion right when Adams moved in in 1800. And it was a tiny little building, a tiny town in the South. And what Jefferson believed, if Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. is this rural southern town, it won't be swayed by the big financial interests in Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. Now, of course, that's pretty naive. Couldn't they just elect people to go there? And he also didn't understand the communication that's coming up. But that's what he thought. Now, this is pre-industrial revolution, pre-capitalism. So Jefferson was thinking, just government hands off and small farmers would flourish. But what if capitalism hits? Things didn't quite work the way he thought. And he also was a slave owner. He benefited from land policy, the guy from more land. He benefited from the government protecting, protecting slaves, having slave codes, having a militia. 
He didn't mind the central government, and when he took power, he would use it very, very freely. And so this is one of those, he said it, might do something else. And, where I get the government from? My summer job, all through college, and yes, I actually went to college, was delivering beer. And that was my summer job. It was a great summer job, and not for the reason some of you might be thinking. No, it was because it was a good summer job. We delivered beer all over uh, southeastern Montana. And so we would deliver once every two weeks to beautiful Jordan, Montana. We spin to Jordan. Nobody? Because if you had, you'd brag about it. Mr. Hagen is from Jordan. With a Mustang. It's not much there anymore. But there's a bar like it must it's I think it's mandated by state law that every small town must have either either a corner bar or a stockman's bar. That's state law. So there was a stockman's bar there. And we go, you delivered beer, and you'd stand there, you know, and wait for the manager to sign it. So we'd always be there really early in the morning. It was like nine o'clock in the morning. I'm standing there, and there's always like the same three or four guys. And they would sit in the corner of the bar. They were there every day I was there and complain about the government. Damn government. Trying to get government off our back. Government. And that was actually a big argument. Was it a government or government? Or the end just silent. But the government. Government. Damn government. And I would, of course, be eavesdropping. But, but they would say, and I'll never forget this one time they were complaining about the government. And then one of them says, Oh, have you got your crypt payments yet? I haven't got my crypt check yet. Yeah. Gotta get my check. I need that money. Anybody know what crypt is? It's a conservation program by the United States government. And what they do is they pay farmers, they give them money to not plant on their land. For conservation purposes, like for areas for birds to land, so don't cultivate. So they're getting money from the government. I'm sorry, the government to be able to hang out in the bar and complain about the government. <laughs> and so those guys have always stuck in my head: the damn government, give me this money so I don't have to work. And then they also these were, as it turned out, these guys I saw them on CNN once. In fact, they were on CNN for quite every day for about three months, and all over the national news. They decide to secede from the union because they don't want to pay taxes. And they hold up in their farm and they call out U.S. Marshals and National Guard. And they were called the Freemen. And it was those same guys who were in the bar complaining about the government that decided, well, I want to create my own country. And that's what everyone thought about Montana then. We had those Freemen, we had a few of things like the Unabomber, and like, like, what is going on in Montana? So with that, there's my government story. Damn government. Okay. Jefferson was also obsessed with the West. There's way too many houses in that state. Jefferson was obsessed with the West. Uh, well, hit the back porch of Monticello face westward, so he could always look west. He saw it as his, his domain. He actually tried three different times to send explorers to walk through there to give the U.S. a better claim. Three different times through Louisiana and Oregon. Before the core of discovery and Lewis and Clark. The first time was when he was ambassador to Paris back in 1786. So Jefferson is obsessed. And the reasons were well, one, I mean, if you want a country of agrarian small farmers, what do you need? Farms. So we need land for farms. But the other one is this is a colonial British picture of a tobacco plantation. I put in there because it's sold slaves. But remember, tobacco cultivation just destroys soil. And so, plantation owners like Jefferson are obsessed with land, like Washington was, and they want more land. So this was about land for farmers and plantations. But the third reason, this is why I put, this is kind of a stylized uh, engraving from that type of Creek Indians. And Creek's powerful tribe, even though that's made by disease, in this area right here. And Jefferson is thinking, okay, if we're going to be a nation of small farmers, that means this area has got to be for small farmers. But what about the American Indians who live here? <coughs> what do you do with them? <coughs> Jefferson saw this as the most humane answer. Move them to here. So force them at gunpoint to move across the Mississippi. And that's why he wanted to lose hand. And that one you have to get to move American Indians west. 
This was soon be called Indian removal. And that became the policy of the United States government to remove Indians and move them westward. So these states could open up. And not only would they be for small farmers and plantations, Jefferson's also thinking they'll be Republican states. Now remember, that Republican Party was shit, but that's what he's thinking. And so that's why we went to Louisiana. And that is what he saw as the humane choice. Because what's the other choice? They could not comprehend the choice of letting them live in the land they live in. So what's the other choice? That's the way Jefferson looked at it. And the immor immorality of that is clear, but it also shows you the way they look at the world and their choices. So he's obsessed with move westward, move westward. Got to get more in the West. And that would spread slavery. And he knew it. He knew it. Said we didn't need slaves, didn't need slaves, but we're going to spread. And so the last bit of Jefferson's philosophy, and it might be the most important one, is in reality, he's pragmatic. Jefferson said a lot. Remember we talked about ideology? He said a lot. And yet he would do the opposite. Pragmatic means practical. Yeah, come up with a problem, you find the best solution. This is very thoughtful. Now, being thoughtful does not mean you're smart. It does not mean you're correct. It just means you think things out. Usually, pragmatic people are intellectuals. Once again, intellectuals do not mean that they're smart or correct. It just means they think things out. They try to get evidence. And most American presidents have been pragmatic. A few have them. Jefferson was intensely pragmatic. And to give you an idea how this worked, for example, Jefferson said we must be strict constructionists for the, uh, for the Constitution. We must follow it, follow those enumerated powers. Yeah, when the time came to jump out of buying the land in Louisiana, he stretched the Constitution. They used a treaty to buy it. Nowhere did it say that. That is pragmatic. So that's the treaty signing ceremony. He very stylized it by book like that. Next, the Barbary Wars. The Barbary Wars were against pirates in the Mediterranean who were stopping American ships. Jefferson sent the little tiny navy and its naval infantry called Marines that we have left and sent them to fight the Barbary pirates without a declaration of war. What war did Jefferson claim that they needed a declaration of war when Adams did it? What was that war with the French? Yeah, the quasi or quasi war. He did both pronunciations. And then slavery. Jefferson knew slavery would destroy the Republic, and yet not only did he promote it by pushing it westward, promote it by protecting slave owners, he kept his own slaves and kept his own fine livestock. And when men like Washington, who were very guilty about slavery, oh yeah, he kept them his own life within freedom when he died, not Jefferson. Not Jefferson. He had debts to pay. He didn't want to leave it to his family. So he kept slavery. That's pragmatic. Now, what else would we call somebody who says one thing and does something else? Is he a hypocrite? <laughs> By every defi definition, he is. But let's get back to ideology. If your ideology is closer to Jefferson, will you say, yeah, you know, he said it, but he did the right thing. And if you're opposed, your ideology was opposed to Jefferson, then you might say, oh, total hypocrite liar. Can't trust him. This happens time after time. Where you get people who you agree with, you would defend their lie. Or you might ask for their defense of your lie. Not here, of course. It's, no one here is lied, correct? I guess that by definition is what we call a lie. I'm just saying that. Oh, I know we have. But you know what I mean. You really get this political point of view on who we agree or disagree with is how much we really say they're a hypocrite. So that's his philosophy. I asked if this would be one of your choices, give me a couple good examples of it and what it would and examples of it, and that'd be a good short idea. I gave you a lot of examples. Pick about the main important ones. Pragmatic speech. And so, new heading, or new thing, midnight justice. And what these were, the Federalists were convinced Republicans were going to destroy the government. And so in the four months between the election and the inauguration, 
The Federalists created a bunch of new federal courts and therefore judgeships. Congress creates the court system. And then Adams appointed a bunch of Federalist judges. Boom. Fill them up. How long is a judge? How long is the appointment of a judge? Hmm? Yeah, lifetime so it's as long as they want to be there, as long as they're not impeached. The most important one was a Federalist Chief Justice, a relatively young man named John Marshall. And so the Federalists are thinking, okay, we're going to be out of office. But at least while we'll Federalist courts <coughs> that will control the excesses of these crazy radical Republicans who are not really that radical. And so he'd be on the court for 35 years. And the Marshall Court would be the most important of all the courtships. And I'll tell you why in a sec. But think about what that does for a president. The Adams was dead for a whole decade before John Marshall got the court. He died in 1826. Anybody know what day? July 4th, 1826, 50 years after. Anybody want to guess what other person died on that day? Thomas Jefferson. Both died on July 4th, 1826, 50 years after the Declaration of Independence was ready to sign. Isn't that weird? They actually had a, a rapprochement. They, they were friends. But they're on. And so this court, the Marshall Court, will be the bane to Jefferson's existence because they could pat or they could rule because they gave themselves new powers. The Marshall Court was what we call nationalists. There's all kinds of definitions of nationalism, but in this context, nationalist means pro central government. They want more power to the central government. Now, Jefferson didn't mind more power to the central government, but not from the courts. And the most important court case in Supreme Court history to this day will be decided right away in 1803, Marbury versus Madison. We're not going to go through all the details of the court. Basically, the Republicans tried to eliminate one of the courts that Marbury was appointed to. The Secretary of State was James Madison, who would not seat him, so Marbury sued Madison. And what the Supreme Court ruled is the Republicans cannot pass a law after the court had already been created to not seat him. And this is where we get, where well, you got to get down, this is judicial review. This, the Supreme Court, the Marshall Court, gave them the power to rule on the constitutionality of laws. So they could decide if a court case makes its way to the Supreme Court, all the way there, if a law is constitutional or not. Now, it's going to be a long time for this to be used. Ten years of trying to do it for state powers, but in reality, the court rarely did this for seven years. But then, 1880s, they start doing it more and more, and now we have a very, 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 very activist court, and they are overturning laws all the time. And my guess is it's going to accelerate. They're going to really start overturning laws. And so think about the Supreme Court. They're not elected. They're appointed by the president. How long are they on the court? Forever. You can't get them off. They now represent the minority in the three unions. Jefferson more and more is saying his philosophy that the common people have a choice. And here is this small group of unelected elite. And so Jefferson was furious. He immediately wanted to impeach Marshall. They would impeach one justice who was drunk and insane, Timothy Pickering. By the way, that's a bad combination. I would say being drunk, being a drunkard, bad. Being insane, bad. You're both terrified. He's the only one to be impeached. They tried to impeach others, could not do it. It was too controversial. And they tried to put term limits on the judges, which they could do, but uh, Congress wouldn't do it. And now it is just so controversial that I don't know if they ever can do it. And the point is, the court can go against the will of the people. They're not elected. And so, with that, the Marshall Court gave the Supreme Court all this power they did not have before. And so, we got to jump right into 
land policy, specifically the Treaty of Greenville. Now, the Treaty of Greenville goes back to 1795. There's a huge battle in 1794 right here, what is now Michigan, called Fallen Timbers. The United States defeated an Indian coalition that actually won a big battle before they kind of screwed up here. But it was such a big defeat that the tribes here signed away all these areas in dark gray or dark blue, dark turquoise, whatever color you want. They would go to the United States, and all the rest of that land in the old Northwest would go to the various tribes. Anybody want to guess for how long the Treaty of Greenville said the various tribes would have this land here? Forever. And how long did forever last? And the U.S. very quickly started breaking this treaty. But now it's in the United States has, okay, now we have treaty this land. They went in and surveyed it, and that is going to lead to Jefferson's land policy to try to open up land for small farmers. Open up land for small farmers. And Ohio would be the test case. Here's Ohio, see the little lines here? They surveyed it. And there's one law we need to have, the Enabling Act of 1803. The Enabling Act was really important because the Northwest Ordinance said there could be five states, but this actually set up the procedure to become a state. And it said that these areas will be surveyed, it will create, no, I'm sorry, there will be an Ohio here, and some of the money will be set aside for public education. And all of this would be to open up more land for small farmers. Now, there's two little quirks about this. First up, anybody know who this is? Johnny Appleseed. Have you heard of Johnny Appleseed? He went through planting apple trees. He's a real person, and he was a Republican, and he believed the best way for small farmers where if they could have a piece of land where they already have an apple orchard, where they can start making money right away and become more independent. And what would they sell from the apples? It wasn't the apples. What would you make from apples? Hard cider. Remember, they drank a lot back then, about 10 times more than people do today. Part of the reason was the water was so bad. And so with that, that's Johnny Apples. But also one little ironic twist, they forgot to actually put in the law that Ohio can become a state. They just implied it. So technically, Ohio was not a state until 1995. And yet more presidents have come from Ohio than any other state. <laughs> and it wasn't a state. I have a bunch of bunch of partridges lived there, and including uh, my great 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 grandfather who fought at Antietam and Gettysburg and things like that with an Ohio regiment. They tested the war weren't in the Union. I think that's kind of funny. We're not going to worry about the land policy. Let's get to one thing really quick. Oh, remember I told you about how they drew young men? Everybody liked junior high girls. He was in his thirties. Moving on. The last thing really quick before the bell rings. Jefferson also desperately won in New Orleans, which was until 1801 part of Spain. And then Spain in a secret in a secret uh, agreement gave it to France. It's a long story. But Jefferson realized if I'm going to keep this land here in the Union, we need New Orleans. And he sent two representatives, Robert Livingston and James Monroe, to buy New Orleans from Napoleon. That the now emperor of France, Napoleon, offered the whole thing. All of the land claimed to Louisiana for only fifteen million dollars or three cents an acre. And Monroe and Livingston were there, and they said, "We have no authority to do this. This is already constitutionally dubious." So, how long did it take them to say yes to Napoleon's offer to sell it? About. One quarter of a second. They said, find it! And they go back to the United States and we'll figure it out there. And so I'll explain this on Thursday. I'll tell you the story, but let me get this last thing because this will be on the test. The two big constitutional issues were nowhere in the Constitution says how the U.S. will buy my app. So what did Jefferson do? We should write a treaty. That's not in the Constitution. That's pragmatic, isn't it? And number two, the other one we need to know. Nowhere in the Constitution did it say, would any land from new territories make equal states or would it just be part of a subsidiary empire? Would they be equal states? Federalists are like, no, they don't want more Republican states. 
and that will be a huge controversy. That was actually the big controversy. Controversy? Will they be regular state? And yes, they would be. The Embargo Act will not be on the test. Everyone happy? I'll tell you a few more stories I didn't quite get to tomorrow. I gotta tell you the dueling story. I didn't tell you the story of the duel. I'll tell you tomorrow while you're taking the test. I'll do it on Thursday or Wednesday. Sound good? Will they all be hyped up after a long walk? I'm not looking forward to the walk. What if we lose people? What if a blizzard hits? Have you heard of the Donner Party? I'm really worried about this. You know what happened with the Donner Party? Yes. Okay. So watch your back. We should go. To, we should go to Monticello. Anyone have a nickel? If you look at a nickel, Jefferson's on the front of a nickel, and Monticello's on the back. Or oh, even this one has. Uh, oh, this one has Lewis and Clark thing on the back. They put on. Oh, I have a nickel. On that note, goodbye. I appreciate it.